Uh, good morning uh, and welcome to the fifth meeting in 2015 of the Health and Sport Committee. Um, at this point, as I normally do, I'd ask uh, everyone in the room to switch off mobile phones as they can often interfere with the sound system. But uh, in addition to that, I ask um, members of the public and everyone else <coughs> um, to take note that um, there are some of us using um, uh, tablet devices, uh, which, is, uh, which are instead of our uh, hard copies of the papers. Uh, the first item on the agenda today... Uh, is a decision on taking business in private and ask the committee to agree to take in consideration of our approach to the uh, National Health Service Board's budget scrutiny in private at future meetings. Uh, we, it's our normal practice uh, uh, to, to do this. Uh, is the committee agreed? Yes. I thank you. Um, the second item, um, uh, I should also, um, I think I mentioned the private session, but I should also put on the record that uh, we have apologies today for, for Richard Simpson, for who for understandable reasons is, is not able to be with us. Um, the second item on the agenda today is the Assisted Suicide Scotland Bill. Uh, this is the committee's final evidence session on the bill and we are joined by Patrick Harvey, um, MSP, member in charge. Uh, um, 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 uh, Andrew Millen, Head of Non-Government Bills Unit, and Louise Miller, Senior Solicitor, solicitor <coughs> of, of the, of this, uh, to, to the Scottish Parliament, and Amanda Ward, Advisor to Patrick Harvey. Um, Patrick, uh, you, you, you are prepared uh, 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 an opening statement for us this morning, and if you want to proceed with that, then we'll go on to questions. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you very much, convener, and I will be uh, quite brief. Uh, first of all, can I just uh, put on record my thanks to the committee for the serious consideration that they've given to the bill uh, during the inquiry. This is a more complex bill than many members' bills. Uh, I think my, my previous members' bill was about two and a half sides of A4 and very relatively simple uh, issues. This, this bill does include more complex argument and deserves detailed consideration uh, and I'm grateful that it's received that. My, the, the commitment that I made to Margaret MacDonald was to present her bill as best I could to Parliament. And on that basis, uh, I don't intend uh, during the, the consideration to propose very radical changes to the bill as Margot drafted and introduced it. But I've said from the outset that I'm quite willing to consider uh, changes from other members uh, assuming that they're properly drafted and wouldn't undermine the basic principle of the bill. There are some areas where evidence to date, I think, has shown a good case for making some more minor changes, such as improvements in the recording and reporting procedures. There's also been considerable discussion of the final 14-day time limit, uh, and some witnesses have argued that this is needlessly, needlessly restrictive. Uh, I'm convinced, Kamina, that a, a reasonable solution can be found uh, to that issue and no doubt we can explore that in detail uh, during the questioning. While I don't intend to propose any more radical changes, the difference in eligibility between this bill and the assisted dying bill at Westminster has been noted and, and discussed at committee. The committee uh, may feel that the issues are significantly different in respect of terminally ill people uh, than those with uh, progressive conditions. If the committee eventually decided to recommend uh, changes to these aspects, I would listen with an open mind to what was proposed. Uh, a different position on eligibility, if that was eventually decided, uh, should, in my view, not undermine the basic principle of the bill uh, or prevent Parliament from making progress on this matter. Um, that's all I wanted to, to say in my opening statement, and I, uh, I look forward to the committee's questions. O OK, thank, thanks for that, uh, Patrick. But can you, you mentioned uh, a couple of times the principle of the bill before, uh, just to, to, to tease that out. Could you uh, explain to us, or uh, take this opportunity at this point in time, to, um, uh, to explain to us what you believe the principles underpinning the bill are and, and how you believe that the bill achieves or promotes these principles? In my view, convener, the bill represents the continuation uh, of a, a decades-long change in healthcare and medical practice, away from uh, a slightly top-down approach 
which, as some witnesses have acknowledged, uh, left uh, in, in previous decades or previous generations patients very often excluded from the decision-making process and saw information about their own condition withheld from them. We're moving, and we have moved some considerable way to a position which is much more focused on uh, patient empowerment, on patient decision-making, uh, and on the principle that each of us have the right to determine major choices about our own lives. Uh, the, the position of autonomy, uh, as various panels during the, the inquiry have made clear, autonomy is not uh, and never has been regarded as an absolute principle, uh, but it has an important place in modern health care uh, and in the decisions uh, that, we, that we make about our lives. The, the, the basic principle uh, is to shift power and decision-making uh, into the hands of individuals. And I suppose I would, I would uh, pose this as, uh, in, in a sense, really quite directly taking on uh, some of the arguments that we've heard from some witnesses, arguing that the bill implies or suggests that some people's lives are less valuable than others. Nothing could be further from the truth. This bill takes as its, uh, uh, as its almost as a, a as a first principle, almost at a philosophical level, the idea that because all of our lives matter, because all of our lives are valued, we have the right to make major decisions for ourselves in a supported and an informed way. Uh, and uh, the, the principle of this bill is to place that power in the hands of the people about whom uh, those decisions are being made, that, that we each have a, a right to make those decisions for ourselves uh, in a fully informed and supported way. Richard Lyle. Uh, thank you, Convener, and good morning, Mr Harvey. Um, listened quite intently to your opening statement, and actually most of, uh, or some of what uh, you've said I, I was going to ask you, but we all had uh, a high regard for Margot MacDonald, and can I first of all thank you for taking her bill forward and also for the work that you've done on it. But the concern that most people have, whether you support this bill or not, there is a concern, and there are flaws. And you say it's very com in your opening statement. You said it's very complex. How, in, in regards to the comments that have been made, and you've sat in most of the evidence sessions, if not all, uh, how would you address some of the concerns that people have, the flaws that are in this bill? How how can we resolve it? Will it be? And, and you're basically saying that you you welcome amendments. How many amendments do you think we need to? be made to this bill in order to make it fit for purpose? Well, I would argue that the bill is fit for purpose. Uh, I, I don't think there have been many major pieces of legislation that the Scottish Parliament has passed that haven't uh, seen some amendment. Uh, the, the parliamentary scrutiny process is an important one and it, its value is uh, shown through the way in which bills are shaped during that scrutiny process. Uh, I think of the, the particular areas that I flagged up in my opening statement, I think it would be relatively straightforward, for example, to ensure that uh, initial reports are to the Procurator Fiscal, the Crown Office of Procurator Fiscal Service, rather than to the police. I think that's something which has been broadly acknowledged as uh, the, the right uh, change to make, a fairly minor change, but the right one to make. I think the police, the Crown Office uh, and other witnesses have all broadly agreed that that would be a, an appropriate change. I think it would be relatively straightforward to uh, ensure that there's some process for reporting to a central body which uh, maintains, a, uh, a, a, maintains an overview of the, uh, the cases which have uh, gone forward under assisted suicide. I think those are relatively straightforward changes to make. And as I've said, uh, my, my view would not be that I would be proposing more radical changes. Um, where some of the concerns have arisen, uh, for example, the context in which we make decisions. Uh, 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 and this relates to the, the notion that autonomy is not an absolute principle. All of us make decisions about our lives in context. Uh, that, for example, is one area where uh, the situation might be seen to be very different in respect of someone who is dying, someone who has very little time left to live and wants to take control of the timing of that death. Uh, and the manner of that death. Those, those issues are very different in that circumstance than someone who has uh, a, a progressive condition. Uh, and it may be that the committee will, will feel that it wants to take a different view 
uh, about eligibility for those reasons. Um, I, I think rather than try and answer the, the, the question about what all of the concerns are, I, I wonder if there are specific aspects of, of concerns that the, the member wants me to, to reflect on. Um, it was always, in discussions I had with Margot, it was always my thought that she was talking about people who were near the end of life who basically um, felt that they wanted to go with dignity. But what's been thrown up by many of the, the evidence sessions that anyone, somebody at 20, could walk into a doctor and say, I'm fed up with my life, I, I just want to end it, I want to go. I don't think that was... Do you, do you believe that was Margaret's intention? Or, or, you know, or do you, you agree with me that her intention was that people who are near the end of life, who feel as though that, that, that they have a situation where you know, that, 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 that's their right and the, their belief, and most of the people who are contacting us are, are saying this, uh, do you think that, that was her intention, rather than someone tw at 20 walking in and saying, I, I, I want to commit suicide or I want to be uh, assisted to die? Yes, I think you're, I think you're right in, in general. The, um, the, the phrase, a bit fed up with life, was used by at least one committee witness uh, in uh, you know, a, a suggestion that that would be uh, a reason that someone might seek uh, an assisted suicide. Uh, frankly, I don't think there's any real evidence from the other jurisdictions which do have uh, a form of assisted suicide that people would make such a decision on those grounds, that people would even seek uh, an assisted suicide on those grounds. And in fact, uh, uh, I think in, uh, in Oregon, which th there are some differences from, from the Oregon scenario, but I think it's perhaps the closest parallel, um, the, the evidence shows that the, the vast majority of people who go through with an assisted suicide shorten their life only by a very, very short period. Um, so this, this notion that people would, would seek uh, an assisted suicide because they feel a bit fed up, I, I don't think is, is realistic. Nor indeed would such a person be eligible. Yeah. Uh, it's very clear under the, the criteria uh, of this bill um, that it would be completely uh, unacceptable, it, not legal uh, under this bill uh, for such a person to be uh, offered assistance to commit suicide uh, in this way. Um, I, I think you... you um, you have it right in your, your general description of uh, Margot's intent, uh, and particularly uh, when we look at the, uh, the question of someone's own judgment that the quality of their life is unacceptable, uh, and a recognition from a, a medical professional <coughs> that that judgment is cons consistent with the facts that are known about their condition. Um, these are the circumstances, these are the situations in which people are living and indeed in which some of them are committing suicide. Uh, statistics show that there the, uh, are probably something in the region of 50 suicides of terminally ill people uh, a year uh, at present. Um, now, that's, uh, that's a, a matter that should concern us all. Uh, it's a matter that should distress us all, in fact. And the circumstances in which they're making those decisions uh, are circumstances that I don't think any of us uh, should be willing to say that the law leaves people uh, with, with no other option but that. Thank you, Convener. Rhoda Grant. Thank you, Convener. Um, the bill seeks to make assisting someone to commit suicide legal, to decriminalise assisting someone to commit suicide. Um, but it very expressly outlaws, as the law does at the moment, euthanasia. It doesn't define either of those concepts, and some of the evidence we've had seems to suggest there's a very thin line between them. Some people saying that actually helping someone to take um, the medication or whatever would be assistance. On the other hand, people saying um, that just being there and supporting is assistance. What would you define both as? I think, um, first of all, uh, I would want to explore this notion of decriminalising because as has been made clear from the evidence that you've heard from Professor Chalmers that uh, is included in the papers for today's meeting, there is a, a real lack of clarity uh, about what is criminal and what is not criminal, uh, even beyond what is and is not criminal, what would be and would not be open to prosecution 
under the current law in Scotland. Under the current law in Scotland, uh, people who may be contemplating asking for help to end their life because of intolerable suffering, or people who may be asked uh, by a loved one for help to end their life because of intolerable suffering, have no clarity at all about their legal position, about what actions they may or may not take. So um, I think to characterise this uh, as decriminalising um, assisted suicide is, is slightly too broad a, a description, uh, given the lack of clarity in, in the current law. I think it is... Uh, certainly arguable that um, some greater clarity might be sought in terms of what forms of assistance are necessary. Uh, as I understand Margot MacDonald's original intention, uh, she felt it was inappropriate to be absolutely definitive in listing uh, a, 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 an absolute number of specific acts uh, which count as assistance, uh, which are legally protected under the, under the legislation. Uh, because obviously we, we can't necessarily foresee every scenario uh, in which practical assistance may be necessary. Uh, we also can't necessarily see technological changes which uh, in terms of particular types of drug or drug delivery system uh, which might require one form of assistance or another. So uh, the argument was not to be prescriptive uh, but to talk about uh, someone giving assistance to someone uh, who who needs that help in order then for that person, the person who has requested assisted suicide, ultimately to take the final act. Now, that might be drinking from a cup. It might be uh, operating a machinery that, uh, that uh, uh, an injection pump machine, for example, which uh, delivers a drug intravenously. Um, I think Margot MacDonald's intention was not to be overly prescriptive, but to be clear about the distinction between giving someone assistance to enable them to take a final act uh, and, on the other hand, uh, taking that final act on behalf of someone which is, which is outlawed uh, in the bill and which would, um, in many ways, give greater clarity that that kind of action is illegal in Scotland than, than currently exists. Um, I hear what you're saying about the clarity of the law, but we received evidence as well to say that this assisted suicide under the bill could also be challenged and investigated in the same way um, if there was anybody concerned of coercion or the like. So I just park that there. Coming back to the definition of euthanasia or assisting someone with suicide, um, if we take possibly an example that we know of because we can't, we can't prejudge what might happen in the future, but for instance, if someone were to, to swallow something that was going to be, commit suicide by swallowing something. Would assistance be preparing that medication for them to then pick it up and sw swallow it themselves? Would it be going as far as putting the medication in their mouth to allow them to swallow it themselves? I mean, those are the kind of, I suppose, areas that people are keen to find out because some people would argue that putting something in somebody's mouth that maybe they didn't have if they haven't got the ability to lift something to their mouth, then putting something in their mouth doesn't give them a lot of choice because they won't have the ability to spit it out or, or whatever. So, we, you know, it's, it's something I think that worries people um, and we need to have some kind of clarity. I mean, I would, uh, I would certainly take the view that uh, there's, there's, very, there's a very clear answer to your first scenario in... Uh, preparing a, a mixture or preparing a drug for someone to take, uh, that, that preparation, if someone is not able to undertake that themselves uh, but has someone assist them by, by doing that, uh, it seems to me that, that that would count as assistance rather than taking the final act. And the, the section uh, which prohibits euthanasia, the section which prohibits uh, another person taking that final act on behalf of the person uh, who's requested assisted suicide... Uh, that would not be breached by simply preparing a, a drug for someone to take. Um, I think your, your second uh, example is it's, it's, it's probably quite understandable that you're exploring ideas where the, the, the line is finer. Uh, I think that's probably the kind of area where uh, the, the requirement for directions and guidance uh, to enable 
medical professionals and licensed facilitators to, to reach uh, a, a proper understanding of how the legislation is to operate in practice. Uh, it seems to me that that's a, a, an area where uh, that guidance and, uh, and direction should be given rather than on the face of legislation. It seems that if the legislation is the, making the definition quite clearly that assisted suicide would be legal and euthanasia wouldn't be, surely the legislation has to make the definition between the two acts because it's saying one thing is illegal, one thing is legal. Um, it's surely not down to guidance as to what is legal or illegal. Well, the, the basic principle is that uh, to take the final act uh, of which causes death, the action which causes the death of the individual must be the action of the individual themselves, not the action of another person. Um, I believe there's a case law uh, in relation to uh, Diane Pretty and Debbie Purdy uh, regarding putting a drug in someone's mouth. That, that would be seen as another person taking that final act. Uh, but again, in, in the absence of legislation uh, either in England or Wales or in Scotland, uh, the, 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 the lack of clarity is far greater today than it would be under this legislation. What this legislation seeks to do, uh, and I think in relation to Professor Chalmers' evidence it's, it's clear, it would not um, resolve the lack of clarity in, in all circumstances, but it would provide some circumstances a clear path where there is clarity where someone knows the conditions under which they're entitled to ask for assistance and other people know the conditions under which they're entitled to give assistance. Uh, for, for anyone who sought to uh, procure or to, or to uh, instigate an assisted suicide out with the terms of this legislation where it passed, uh, then the courts would deal with the matter as they would deal with it today. Uh, this legislation seeks to give clarity about a path which is acceptable and, and which does have legal protection. Okay. Bob Doris. Um, thanks, Convener. Um, yeah, I want to return to um, some earlier points in relation to the eligibility criteria for in relation to, to assisted suicide. So, uh, as the bill outlines, it's an illness that is for the person either terminal or life shortening or a condition that is for the person progressive and either t terminal or life shortening. Um, but obviously there will be no definitive list of what that would mean. So for example, would liver disease, would heart disease, would diabetes, would smoking. Uh, I'm trying to tease out how broad those provisions are. Have you given any calculation to how many people there are living in Scotland today who would qualify, should they wish to, um, to to apply for assisted suicide under un, un, under this act, because the concern I would have would be that it's that's too broad. So, have you done a calculation how many people living in Scotland today would um, would qualify? Again, uh, as with uh, definitions of what counts as assistance, I think it would be inappropriate to produce a definitive list of conditions, uh, given that uh, medical. Uh, science changes and, and our understanding of, of conditions and illnesses changes uh, and, and such a definitive list would be in danger of rapidly going out of date. Um, I think some of the, some of the arguments from uh, a, a, a few witnesses seem to be painting a, a, a really very broad, a, a quite unreasonably broad interpretation uh, of the eligibility criteria. Uh, I think one witness suggested uh, everyone in Mary Hill would qualify. I, I think that would that would disturb you as much as it would uh, me, uh, as uh, both as as members who who represent Glasgow. Um, it's very clear that the eligibility criteria in terms of terminal illness and life shortening conditions are not the only parts uh, of the eligibility criteria. Uh, someone who, in, in the example you gave smokes. Uh, yes, smoking would shorten somebody's life, but it is not in, in itself a progressive condition, uh, nor indeed uh, would it necessarily give rise to a quality of life that that person finds unacceptable. Um, 
nor would uh, a medical professional be able to uh, sign off on a, a first or second request uh, in, in those circumstances because the facts of the person's life would not be compatible uh, with the, the test that is required under the legislation. Um, as far as take-up is concerned and the likely numbers, uh, I think it's clear from many jurisdictions that have a form of assisted suicide that take-up is relatively low. And in, in fact, uh, the, the projection uh, in the accompanying documents uh, that were produced by Margot MacDonald on the bill's introduction uh, suggest uh, something in the region of, uh, I think, 80 uh, per year um, in Scotland. Now, we can't be crystal ball gazers on a matter like that. Uh, it's, it's pretty clear that uh, that's comparable with uh, the, the take-up in other jurisdictions. Um, but I think it, it's, it's very clear that um, even where there have been uh, political decisions in other jurisdictions to broaden the eligibility criteria and that may have led to an increase in numbers, it remains a very low proportion uh, of overall deaths. Um, the only other thing I would say on this is that I have a slight concern that a, 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 an overly uh, concerned focus on the number uh, who would take up uh, assisted suicide almost implies that there is a right number or a wrong number. Uh, if we believe in the basic principle uh, of empowering individuals to make decisions about their own lives, uh, then we shouldn't be in a position of telling them that they've made the wrong choice or deciding that the wrong number uh, have made that choice. Um, so, you know, it, it seems to be reasonable to assume that take-up would be comparable with other jurisdictions, uh, but I, I'm, I'm slightly cautious about uh, a position which implies there is a, a right or a wrong number. Right. Well, I, 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 I've listened carefully. I, I wasn't suggesting there was a right or wrong number. I, I was asking how many people would, in theory, potentially qualify within Scotland. So, for example, uh, would type 2 diabetes count as a progressive condition uh, to allow people to, if they so wish to? I mean, I, I genuinely don't know because we've had evidence to say that it's, the eligibility criteria is too broad so I'm looking for clarity in just how broad that eligibility <laughs> criteria is. Um, it seems very clear to me that merely having a diagnosis of type 2 diabetes uh, would not satisfy the, the tests in, under this bill which have been described by some witnesses as a, as a high bar. Uh, someone would not uh, be in a position of saying that the, the quality of their life was unacceptable a medical practitioner would not be in a position of countersigning a, a first or a second request on the sorry, basis purely sorry, of such a diagnosis. Where, where would, I mean, what can I get the clarity in that then? Where would the guidance be for the medical practitioner? Because I'm, I'm looking at the, it says the illness is for the person. So it's very much subjective rather than objective. So if someone goes to their GP and goes, look, I, I'm living with this. Um, I don't want to live with this anymore. For me... I don't want to continue with this. It's subjective to that person, or is it, ob is it an objective criteria for the clinician? And that's what I'm trying to get to, where the clarity is within that. And it's maybe worth just pointing out that in relation to Mary Hilburn mentioned before, indeed, I, I stay there, I think the discussion was around the amount of people who are on prescription antidepressants and current high suicide rates and significant mental health problems that have been certain parts of the, the community and whether or not they would be more predisposed because of other vulnerabilities towards and let, let's not mention me there's lots of places across Scotland that are like of that course. Mary Hill's a wonderful place that, it, 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 but there's lots of places across Scotland where someone because of their life experience may find it hard to cope with a, a life limiting condition and it's very much subjective so I was just looking for a bit of clarity about whether or not um GPs, clinicians will be given some guidance as to say, well, actually, no, we don't, we don't agree with you that um, we don't agree with you in relation to this. And the person says, well, actually, uh, but it's me, it's for me to make that judgment call. It's autonomy, it's, it's self-management of my condition, it's my independence. Uh, I'm making that decision, and the clinician goes, well, actually, I don't agree with that. Where does the balance of power lie in that relationship, and will there be guidance for clinicians? 
yeah, thank you. The, the, your points about the social context uh, are, are absolutely uh, understood and, and well made, not only in relation to geographic areas, but to, yeah. to categories of people or types of people uh, or life circumstances, absolutely. Um, I think it's important to acknowledge, first of all, that the, um, the, the phrase for the person, uh, which you, you mentioned, uh, is not simply a reflection of the, the individual's opinion. It's, uh, it's intended to recognise that the same illness or condition uh, can have a very different manifestation, a different impact on different people. Uh, I think, secondly, um, there's a question of whether... Um, whether uh, the, the social context, the social circumstances in which somebody lives, having a likelihood to shorten their life is, is what's intended. My understanding of the bill uh, as it's drafted is that it's the condition itself uh, which uh, needs to be life-shortening rather than the social context in which uh, a person lives. Uh, and f uh, I would also mention... Um, in relation to the balance between subjective and objective uh, aspects of this, uh, section uh, 9.2c, this is the, the part where uh, someone has made a first request uh, and uh, a, an endorsement of this is required by medical practitioner statements. Um, the practitioner may only make such a statement endorsing the request if, in the opinion of the practitioner, the person's conclusion that the person's quality of life is unacceptable is not inconsistent with the facts known to the practitioner. So, yes, there is an individual judgment about a person's own quality of life. But in order to endorse, have a medical practitioner statement endorsing that first request, uh, the facts must be consistent with that person's judgment. Uh, and so uh, I think it, it's important to recognise that while an individual's judgment may be subjective, the medical practitioner also has an objective test that they have to be satisfied with uh, in order to uh, sign off on that, that request. Okay, it's just a final little bit on that, if that's okay, sorry. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, that, that's helpful, but I'm just wondering, would there be further guidance in relation to uh, the practitioner to decide in relation to what facts he or she should take into account when signing off on that request? Will there be further guidance in relation to that? Uh, y yes, I'm, uh, I'm, I've no doubt at all that there would be uh, professional guidance uh, in relation to many aspects of this, in including the, the medical professionals involved. I would also just add uh, that um, in relation to some of the vulnerability that... Uh, Bob Doris is talking about in terms of social context. Uh, the only robust piece of evidence that we have uh, from other jurisdictions uh, is from uh, the Netherlands and Oregon, which looked at a range of, of groups in terms of their vulnerability or perceived vulnerability uh, and found no evidence uh, that they were more likely to go through with assisted suicide. In fact, they were less represented. Those, those groups were less represented uh, than uh, in the general population. So, uh, again, I, I think you know, we should be looking at what is the experience of other jurisdictions and what can we learn from the, the actual lived experience that they're having. OK, that's surely helpful. Just in terms of the guidance you referred to, um, Mr Harvey, you, you mentioned professional guidance. Are you assuming that beyond the, the, the narrative that you read out from, from, from the, the legislation that any additional guidance would be professional one via the medical profession rather than, say, statutory guidance as part of, of this bill? Yeah. Um, I think there have been a couple of areas um, where it's been clear that the reserved nature of the regulation of the medical professionals uh, is, uh, of, of the medical professions, sorry, is uh, an area which, uh, unfortunately, we're, we're not able to, to step over. Uh, I think... In, in relation to a, a wide range of uh, life and death decisions which medical professionals make uh, on a daily basis in Scotland under the current law, uh, it's very clear that the existing uh, nature of, of non-statutory guidance, something which this Parliament can't legislate for, even if it wished to, 
uh, is, uh, is providing a proper context in which decisions uh, of this nature can be made. Okay. Th thank you, convener. Just can I ask Ms. Harvey, just, just on that, that point of guidance, because the, the basic principle you referred to earlier, was, uh, earlier on was empowerment of the individual. It would seem to me that we're going to get back to a situation if we pass the bill that we would have guidance that would be developed and drawn up by professionals, which would take you back to the point it wouldn't be the individual, it would be professionals that would, that would finally agree how this would work. So, I don't, you know, is there, a, is there not an issue here with the basic principle in terms of its scope, as you've just described, and, and indeed the concession that how this would be developed as a medical treatment would be, you know, signed off by prof medical professionals who seek to diminishing their power over the individual. You know, I, I just, I, don't, I, don't, I might be getting it wrong, but, I, you know, we're heading back to the professionals having the final, final say, and I don't see how that meets the, the principle, uh, as you outlined earlier, of the bill. I understand, but I, I, I don't think that it does. Um, what we're talking about is uh, very clearly going to be people whose lives are already intimately connected to... Uh, not just medical care, but very often complex medical and social care as well. Uh, it's, it seems uh, uh, inevitable that if people are able to make these decisions, they are making them in the context, uh, hopefully, of the, of the loving care of the, their family, but also of the professional and medical care uh, of those working to support them. Uh, the way in which medical professionals engage with that, the way in which they relate to that decision-making process, absolutely needs to be the subject of, of regulation. I think I, I really don't think I've met anybody who's a supporter or opponent of the principle of this legislation who would not agree that a test of capacity, for example, needs to be involved, that someone's mental capacity to make a decision, to understand uh, the context in which they're making the decision and the consequences of it, it absolutely has to be uh, a part of the legislation. Uh, and for a, a medical professional to be able to uh, sign off a, on a, a first or second request, uh, it, it seems um, it seems quite unreasonable to, to imagine that they should do so in the absence of any guidance about how they apply the, the professional standards. But we're talking about you know in the context of eligibility, and the, the, I don't know if it's a new phrase that you use, intolerable suffering, that you referenced the, 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 this morning. You know, it's not too far-fetched to get advanced diabetes, going blind, amputations, and intolerable su suffering, which you would wish to keep open for that person to be eligible for assisted suicide, I presume. If it's their judgment that the quality of their life is unacceptable, they would but be open to... How does to... that square with the principle of that individual? The principle that you outlined today was that the individual had that opportunity, if not right, to have that final say over the say of professionals. He should have the professional support to proceed on his individual will. Um, I, if those I, guidelines say we will not countersign anything other than other definitions that other juri jurisdictions are, are, are operating or proposed to operate, which would be terminal illness. So that would immediately say that people with that advanced uh, diabetes or other similar comorbidity problems who consider them, their lives as they currently are intolerable would be excluded. You're not prepared. You're not prepared to, you want to keep that as open as possible so that the argument can be made for, 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 for those people, irrespective of well, medical device, uh, advice. Well, I've, I've been asked questions about specific scenarios uh, and, and I've tried to, to explore that. Uh, I mean, it, it seems to me that it is for the committee to determine if it accepts the, the basic principle 
that some form of legalised assisted suicide should be provided for in Scotland. It, it seems to me it's up to the committee to determine whether it wants to restrict that only to terminally ill people. I don't intend to make a case for that change, uh, although if the committee reached that view, uh, I might understand why that view had been reached. Um, it's, uh, it seems to me that the, the implication of, of what you're suggesting in, in terms of the absence uh, of guidance for medical professionals uh, would leave us open to the criticism uh, that Richard Lyle mentioned, some witnesses had made earlier, that this was simply about people who were fed up with life. Uh, you know, the, 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 the requirement has to be that this is about a, a serious decision made for serious reasons uh, in circumstances which uh, society would accept that someone has a, a right to make this uh, request for assistance and that, that we have a, a duty as a society to give that assistance. Most people, I think, would not accept that that should be done uh, in, in the context of someone who is simply fed up with life. And so this, this notion of uh, someone reaching a decision that their, the quality of their own life is unacceptable to them and a medical professional uh, accepting and, and countersigning in the, uh, the endorsement of the, the request for assistance, that that conclusion, that that person's own conclusion is not inconsistent with the facts uh, as, as known to that medical professional, this seems to me the right approach. Mike McKenzie. Thank you, convener. Um, it seems to me, in terms of the criticisms that we've heard of the spirit of the bill, that um, it, uh, the, the most significant one, certainly in my book, is the possibility that the bill gives rise uh, for coercion, that people may feel that they've been coerced into the situation where they take this uh, choice. Um, but... Most of the critics of the bill and of the spirit of the bill seem to proceed from the basis that the status quo is actually perfectly satisfactory, and yet we've heard evidence um, that suggests it's not um, in legal terms, because currently we seem to be in a very grey area legally. Um, the decision of uh, Procurator Fiscal is whether or not it's in the public interest to prosecute or not seems to me to be um, a decision that one individual might differ greatly in taking that decision from another. And equally, we've heard evidence that um, it's perfectly legal for doctors to prescribe lethal doses of painkillers in certain circumstances. Um, and that would seem to be one in which we were you know, reasonably happy for doctors to take the decision public prosecutors to take the decision, but not individuals to take that decision about themselves. But, and, and what I'm getting at in terms of this significant concern about coercion, does the status quo, in your opinion, offer any safeguards for the possibility or against the possibility of coercion? Um, and, and, and in that sense, is the bill perhaps neutral in effect rather than uh, giving rise to this possibility? Uh, I would certainly say that I don't believe that the current law um, adequately protects people from uh, the possibility of coercion. For example, uh, the uh, estimate that some dozens of terminally ill people currently commit suicide uh, in a way which is very clearly uh, unsupported, very clearly uh, not part of a, a, a situation which medical professionals or others can... Uh, have a, a, an oversight of and to ensure that they are free from, from any aspect of coercion. Uh, it, it seems to me that the current law uh, fails to give that protection. Uh, one of the, the witnesses, um, uh, I think it may have been the Care Not Killing uh, campaign organisation, uh, argued that the, the best approach, uh, the, the most defensible laws, I think he, he argued, uh, are those which give a clear uh, line about what is forbidden, but then give very broad discretion to the courts to determine uh, whether compassion is required and, and whether a prosecution uh, is, is legitimate. I think that gives the absolute minimum level of clarity, the, the lowest possible level of clarity uh, to people who are in these very difficult circumstances as to, uh, first of all, what is permitted, 
what they may ask for by way of assistance, what they may give by way of assistance, but also how they can uh, access protection if they, if they are uh, under the threat of any form of coercion. Um, I would have to say that you know, other options exist for the committee if, if the committee was minded to uh, find in favour of the general principle but felt that there was uh, some additional safeguard being required uh, against the, the possibility of coercion. Uh, the committee might even feel that a, a criminal offence should be created uh, in relation to uh, trying to uh, induce or incite someone to make a, a first or second request under the legislation that could be criminalised. Um, I think that in some ways would uh, give a, a, a clearer position in terms of what was against the law than the current legislation does, uh, which, which clearly isn't even uh, giving clarity as to whether suicide itself is, is legal or illegal as an act, and therefore what situation somebody is in uh, who does uh, either assist or, or uh, pressure someone to, to take that action. Um, so, yeah, I, I think there are, there are options that the committee has open to it, uh, either to endorse or indeed to strengthen uh, the, the provisions against coercion. But I think it would be quite strange to imagine uh, that coercion is not an issue either in, in the case of people who currently uh, commit suicide in, in these very difficult circumstances uh, or who make other decisions about their medical care, such as uh, the decision to refuse or to end a, a form of treatment uh, or to undergo a very risky form of treatment, uh, the, the, the possibility of coercion exists today in those circumstances. Uh, I'm confident that the vast majority of medical professionals who are providing that care would treat that very seriously and would be uh, capable of identifying and, and addressing those concerns. Uh, this bill would create a much clearer legal context in which those uh, issues can be addressed uh, and, uh, and, and additional protection provided. Thank you. In, in, in terms of the general discussions that, and evidence sessions that we've had, and I know you've intended, I think, all of them, if not certainly most of them, um, how, feel do you, do you, how far do you feel that our discussions have been characterised from by a, a kind of disinclination to actually discuss the whole business of death uh, that we have as a society? Um, and, and, and the second thing being that as a society, we have a kind of cultural taboo against suicide in general. And that, um, so that we're not approaching this from a, a neutral or objective standpoint, but rather even, it seems to me, some of the legal witnesses from a, um, you know, uh, from a perspective that's perhaps not as rational as it ought to be. I think that's a fair comment. Um... I mean, can any of us really uh, approach any aspect of this subject with a completely neutral mind? I don't know how uh, I would feel if I was in the, the circumstances that this bill envisages uh, for people. I don't know what decision I would want to make. Um, and it's very difficult for any of us to think entirely objectively and neutrally as, as though uh, this is merely an academic question. It's, it's not. It's a... It's a, a question which engages with people's, yes, with, with academic uh, analysis and with legal analysis, but also with people's emotional lives and, for, for some people, uh, a very important religious or spiritual aspect of life. Uh, and so people do approach this issue for, for these reasons with very different worldviews, with very different attitudes to the meaning uh, uh, and the impact, uh, both for themselves and other people, uh, of a decision like this. It's precisely because people approach this question with such different worldviews and attitudes that our society should respect people on their own terms, in my view, uh, and to, to our greatest extent possible, empower people to make informed decisions, uh, assuming that they are adults with the capacity to make those decisions, uh, to empower them to do so and to support them to do so. Um, the, the only alternative is for a society to decide what is right for everybody uh, and to impose that decision on everybody. Thank you. That's, thank you, Kim. 
Just on the, you know, Mike's give some clarity on that. I mean, we've had, uh, you know, we've heard the evidence that we have an effective uh, safeguard for the protection of vulnerable people, uh, and that is to maintain the, the law of homicide and uh, someone who causes uh, the, the death of someone else should be reasonably expected to be investigated, uh, justify their actions, and indeed may have to face prosecution. But, you know, we've had evidence that that's clear, it's unambiguous, and the outcome will depend on what motivated that person, whether it was of wicked intent or whatever, and, the, and, and they can be charged with murder or, or homicide or, or be able to justify their actions. You know, they, you know, that's, that's clear. It gives protection to vulnerable people, we've heard. And, and it's something that we would expect when something as serious as the death of an individual takes place. What's unclear about that? It's, it's not you I'm questioning, Mike. I'm referring to the evidence and I'm addressing my question to Patrick. I would just... Actually, I'm asking Patrick. Um, there is clearly a very significant difference of opinion about the degree of clarity that the current law provides uh, about what is legal and illegal and what might be prosecuted or not prosecuted. Um, I suppose we've, we're left in, in, in that context with a, a question about whose responsibility it is to give clarity. Do we leave this to the courts, uh, as has been done south of the border, uh, and some progress has been made uh, through those court actions in seeking prosecution guidelines from the uh, DPP. That hasn't happened in, in Scotland. Do we leave this matter for the courts to determine on a case-by-case -case basis with people having to... really having to go through the most extraordinary efforts uh, over prolonged periods of time uh, when they're facing... Uh, as, as Mike rightly reminds us, uh, I think, um, profoundly challenging uh, circumstances uh, as, they, as they approach uh, either an illness that causes them intolerable suffering or uh, an illness which is going to result in their own death. Do we leave people having to go to the court and asking, asking, asking time and time again for some degree of clarity, for some change in the law? Or do we leave them... Uh, simply uh, in a position where those who are uh, wealthy enough uh, or who have a, enough support around them and, and uh, resources to make the trip to another jurisdiction where this is legal? Or should Parliament make a decision? Uh, I think it's pretty clear that we have a, a, a situation where, yes, there are concerns around issues about coercion, there may be differences of opinion about what the appropriate level of eligibility should be. But it seems to me there is an overwhelming public uh, mood, uh, as shown from consistent opinion polling over many years, that people who take an action uh, in, uh, in the best of intentions, uh, an act of compassion, uh, to end the suffering of a loved one or allow them to do that on their own request, uh, at their own instigation... Uh, I think there's a clear public appetite that people in that situation should not be prosecuted, uh, convicted, sentenced or imprisoned. Now, do we simply leave that to the courts to determine in every individual circumstance or does Parliament have a responsibility, and I think it does, uh, to set the expectation, uh, to, to make it clear that there is a, a legal option which will be well regulated, which will be defined and which will be uh, uh, monitored and, and supervised to, to make that decision in a supported context. Um, I think it's Parliament's responsibility to make a decision here. Now, it may be that Parliament ultimately wants to decide that people in these circumstances are all criminals and should be prosecuted. Uh, I think that would not be in keeping with the public expectation on this matter. But we could change the way that the prosecutors and the law deals with these situations, couldn't we, as you refer to as guidelines? Uh, prosecution guidelines, you mean? Well, yes, we, 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 could, we, we could change the law and our, our guidelines and that, and that to give 
a greater understanding and explanation about what circumstances would be fair and what would be justifiable or whatever it could be. That is in, indeed uh, an option which the Lord Advocate may wish to consider. And uh, I think for the third time I'll refer to uh, Professor Chalmers' uh, evidence where he, um, I think toward the end of it, uh, suggests that the, uh, the decision... Uh, of the Lord Advocate not to take steps to issue a, a policy similar to that by the DPP. Uh, Professor Chalmers says that approach was wrong, it remains wrong. He goes on to question whether the, the lack of clarity about prosecution uh, rules is even compatible with ECHR. Uh, I, I take the view still that um, whatever prosecution guidelines might say, uh, this should be a matter for Parliament to decide what the law says rather than for us to be uh, leaving this for individuals to have to go through uh, a lengthy and a stressful court process simply in order to seek clarity. Uh, Nanette Millen, then I'm followed by Dennis Robertson. Dennis, good afternoon, Nanette. Uh, thank you, convener. Morning. Um, good morning. You alluded briefly earlier on to the fact that our conscience clause cannot be included in primary legislation, and presumably, therefore, not in secondary legislation either, and would have to be dealt with through professional guidance. Um, and of course, as we know, professional guidance is not legally enforceable. Now, I think this has caused significant concern to a number of the health professionals. And I think when the, particularly the pharmacy representative was giving evidence, she really felt very, very strongly that there should be a much stronger um, way of people not taking part in, in um, action if this bill becomes law um, than just professional guidance. Have you any comments to make on that? Um. I think uh, I mentioned in, in relation to the test of capacity that I've never met anybody uh, who takes a view on this bill who doesn't agree that such a test is, is required. Similarly, I've not met anybody who's taken a, a view on this bill, supportive or uh, in opposition to the bill, who doesn't agree that if it's passed, uh, there should be a conscience clause uh, of this nature. Uh, we're in a position where we're not able to pl place that on the face of the bill. That's for purely legal uh, or constitutional uh, reasons. Now, whether whether the, the view is that, um, that that would be better on the face of the bill or not, it's clear from a number of witnesses uh, that the provision of that, uh, that option, that conscience uh, option uh, in guidance, it would be an acceptable provision. Um, a number of witnesses have said that in, in writing, and uh, I think at least one or two have made that clear in oral evidence uh, after my questioning during the committee's earlier sessions. Um, I, th I think while this is very clearly something of, of great importance uh, to those who would not be willing, uh, particularly those medical professionals who would not be willing to participate in assisted suicide, it is actually one of the more easily resolved matters. It's, uh, th there's no disagreement in principle uh, that individuals should be able to make that that decision, and I don't think there's any substantive disagreement that uh, uh, placing this in, in professional guidance would be an adequate uh, protection for them. I mean, we, we have had inevitable comparisons to the previously enacted abortion law and, and the, the fact that courts can overturn um, guidance, and I think there was a recent court case where nurses who did not want to be part, part, taking part in abortions were essentially ruled out of order by by the court. Does, does that trouble you that this could happen? Down the line, admittedly, but this could, could happen with, with this bill. No. Uh, and uh, the, the reason why it doesn't trouble me is that I, I think the, uh, the um, intent and the consequences of, of that particular case have been somewhat misrepresented. What was sought there uh, was not uh, to overturn the, the conscience clause in relation to abortion. What was sought there was to dramatically uh, expand uh, the protection uh, in, in terms of conscience clause from those uh, who were not directly involved in, in providing abortion uh, to those who had more ancillary or tangential relationships with those others who were providing uh, abortion. This was, in effect, um, uh, legal activism in order to uh, it, have the effect of reducing 
the ability of healthcare professionals to provide abortion services. Uh, I don't see any relevance uh, to, to this, uh, the, the, the issue before us today. Uh, it seems to me that the important thing is to ensure that those, perhaps a majority, perhaps not, those medical professionals who would be unwilling uh, to have any role in, in providing uh, or, for example, in, in signing off on a, on a, a request for assisted suicide, uh, are able to decline to do so. Uh, I don't think that's technically difficult to achieve, uh, and I don't think there's any principled opposition uh, to doing so. Um, the, um, I, I think the, the other um, suggestion uh, I, I might make is that um, even if we were able to place this on a statutory basis, uh, if it was legally possible, if it was competent for this parliament to, to put that on the face of this bill, uh, clearly it's not in terms of regulation of the professionals, uh, I don't think it would have a, a, a material bearing on uh, a, a case similar to the one that you mentioned, if, if one was to arise. Uh, but I, I see very little likelihood that it would. Okay, the, the, the other thing that kind of almost ties in with this is that there's a feeling for people who are medical people opposed to the bill that this could change the sort of relationship, the patient-doctor relationship um, of someone who is presenting with a paternal illness um, that the, um, assisted suicide might well become a, a tre an alternative treatment option which could I, I imagine well, I, I can see would radically change the, the sort of position of trust if you like between patients and their their, not their doctor. Um, do, do you think, do you see any ethical problem with this? Oh, there are certainly uh, ethical factors to consider, as there are in many aspects of, of medical practice. Um, would it change the relationship between doctor and patient? Um, the relationship between doctor and patient is continuing to change, and as I, as I said earlier on, I think there's been an ongoing, long-term and very welcome change in that relationship from um, what I might put in, in simple terms, a doctor knows best attitude, uh, which once was very common, uh, once was the normal expectation, um, now to a position where uh, autonomy, recognised as a, as a non-absolute concept in, in philosophical terms, um, autonomy is an important part of that relationship and we we seek to, to take the view where uh, individuals are informed and empowered to be a part of the decision-making process, to be central to the decision-making process. Um, I see this as a continuation uh, of that change. Um, in itself, I think the, the most likely cultural change uh, in the relationship between doctors and patients perhaps uh, relates to um, what I think I think Mike McKenzie mentioned about the, uh, the, the, the cultural reluctance that we have to discuss death. I see this as opening up the possibility, not guaranteeing, but opening up the possibility that it becomes much more normal for people uh, who are fit and well uh, in registering with a GP, for example, to have a discussion about what a general attitude might be. Uh, I suspect uh, although, as I said earlier, I don't know what decision I might ultimately make if I face these circumstances, I suspect that I would uh, want to make a preliminary declaration uh, and have that recorded in my uh, medical records uh, at an early stage, before I was uh, seriously contemplating the, the, the position of having to ask for assistance uh, to end my life. To have that discussion uh, with a doctor, to have that discussion openly uh, uh, about the the general attitude one takes to this issue, uh, I think could be a very positive change uh, and a welcome one. And as I say, a continuation uh, of this transfer of power and decision-making about our lives uh, to the person uh, living a life. I can you know, just briefly, I mean, I think that I, I absolutely agree with you about the, the need to discuss um, one's ultimate death. Um, but the same applies, of course, in relation to palliative care. I mean, we know that Marie Curie I feel very, very strongly that there should be open discussion from really the time of diagnosis. People should be looking forward to the end, if you like. And I, do you, I think some people feel there'd be an incompatibility here between really promoting 
pro really good palliative care. And the, the next treatment option, which is certain death, um, by, you know, by one's own hand. Um, I, I don't know what your thoughts are on that. Um, well, again, uh, as with questions of uptake, I think we should look at the experience of other jurisdictions where some form of assisted suicide uh, does exist legally uh, and uh, uh, th where the provision is made. Um, the evidence uh, shows no impact uh, in, in terms of undermining palliative care, either in terms of its political importance and the investment which is provided or the quality uh, of, of that provision. Um, in Oregon, for example, the quality of palliative care is considered excellent uh, and uh, the use of assisted dying legislation has been described as very low uh, by researchers uh, in that state. Um, and uh, investment in palliative care in Belgium and the Netherlands has increased since legislation was passed uh, on uh, their versions of, uh, of, of this legislation. I, I think it's... Um, I think it's clear that these are uh, entirely compatible options uh, and that if we seek to empower people, if we seek to give people the ability to make their own choice on their own terms, then what we will do is ensure that both of these options are provided to a high standard uh, and that they are both regarded as having political importance. <laughs> I see no evidence from around the world that these are not compatible uh, uh, approaches to patient care. Thank you, Convener. We'll leave it at that just now. You want a supplementary, Rhoda? A point that arose in the, in the previous questioning, um, where uh, Patrick Harvey said that he would envisage that in your general discussion, first meeting with your GP, you would make a primary declaration. How does that then impact if your GP, and we understand something like maybe 5% of the medical profession are willing to engage with this, then only 5% of people would be able to do that in their initial uh, contact with their GP? Or do you suggest that everyone should have an initial contact with a GP who was willing to, to assist this legislation? It doesn't, really, doesn't appear to me compatible with the conscience clause. Um, the... The Section 4 of the bill doesn't require that the person's own GP is the person who uh, endorses the preliminary declaration. Now, if I... I we, we are hypothetical to a certain extent here, but if, I, uh, if this bill had been passed uh, and had come into force and I had a discussion with my GP making it clear that I wanted to lodge a preliminary declaration and my GP was unwilling to do that, because of a, a, a conscientious objection to the, to the whole principle. But I was still happy with my GP, and I wanted to stay with my GP, uh, then it would be perfectly reasonable to ask for somebody else, a different medical professional, to endorse that preliminary declaration. But it still opens up the possibility that I can have this discussion uh, in the knowledge that ultimately uh, a decision... <coughs> Uh, is open to me, which previously, legally, would not have been open to me if I was facing those, those circumstances. So uh, I, I don't think that the, uh, the approach that I'm suggesting to the pre preliminary declaration is in any way uh, in conflict with the, the principle of a conscience clause. But how could, sorry, how could the GP know that you would have capacity at the time? It seems to me that if you make it that early on, the GP can't Judge one, if you're, the situation is intolerable, if you will have capacity. If, do you understand me? If somebody can just put in their records, it seems that that then doesn't become a safety net at all. The preliminary declaration being endorsed is not a statement that somebody has the capacity ultimately uh, to request assistance to commit suicide uh, and for that to be taken forward. Uh, that capacity test is much later on in the process uh, or at least is later on in the process. Um, and if you, if you look at the, um, the preliminary declaration itself, uh, which is in page 12 of the printed bill uh, under the statement, um, the, the note by the uh, medical practitioner uh, simply says, I'm satisfied that the above declaration, uh, above preliminary declaration and witness statement conform with Schedule 1 to the Act. 
uh, and on the basis of the facts known, I have no reason to believe that anything stated in the declaration or witness statement is false. This is not about saying someone can now proceed to have an assisted suicide. There are significant further steps, the first and second requests, which somebody would make when they were felt ready uh, or felt the need that they wanted to request assistance to commit suicide. The preliminary declaration is a, uh, a, a, an earlier stage which simply records uh, in, the, uh, in the patient's records uh, that this is uh, a, you know, a, a declaration they've made. I've got Colin with a supplementary on this line of question and, and Mike on a supplementary on this line of question. Okay, thank you, convener. Good morning. Um, Good morning. Along the same lines, let's assume that um, there's been no preliminary declaration uh, in terms of going to your GP and whatever. And we're looking at um, a situation where someone has drifted into palliative care uh, and starts to think about things themselves. Is <laughs> This is one of the things that, that's been um, running through my mind and all through the deliberations that we've heard in terms of um, how we actually get to deciding, bringing up the subject, mm. particularly if you haven't thought about it before, particularly um, in terms of a, let's assume, a degenerative disease that um, has crept up over a number of years, but somebody's been particularly strong, hasn't thought about going to his GP, been told about palliative care, but eventually, through the course of long-term illness, suddenly decides... You know, or hasn't decided, but or isn't aware, and it's that relationship, I suppose, going to the palliative care um, doctor. Is it his or her um, position that she should or he should bring up the issue of um, uh, assisted suicide, or should this be the option solely brought up by the patient? Because I think this is where the relationship aspect within palliative care in my mind is a little bit grey, murky and I'm not 100% sure um, how this would be brought up. Is it the place of palliative care who's, who are dealing with end of life to bring up the, this option? I think rather than uh, Colin Keir's description uh, of, of grey and murky, I would, I would acknowledge that these are difficult uh, discussions to have. They are difficult discussions to have now uh, in relation to somebody's uh, ongoing care. Uh, when, for example, would somebody uh, discuss with uh, a, a patient that they have a right uh, to decide to end uh, particularly critical treatment, such as dialysis? Uh, when would somebody uh, raise with a person that they have a right uh, to um, refuse um, nutrition or hydration, for example? Uh, in the knowledge uh, that um, uh, that their death would be a, a, an inevitable consequence of that. When would somebody have a right to uh, raise uh, the, the question of uh, a, a range of, uh, of uh, critical decisions that somebody might make uh, which will uh, affect their, uh, their, their, their prognosis, their, their, their likelihood to, uh, to continue to live? Even the questions about someone's attitude to pain relief uh, which will uh, inform a subsequent decision or could inform a subsequent decision uh, about uh, the, the double effect doctrine and the, the impact that that would have on somebody's life. If we take the view that people have a right to be central to that decision-making process, uh, then it's clear that people have a right to information and advice uh, about what the options are. Um, and uh, the, the provision of information... I'm sorry to keep mentioning Professor Chalmers' evidence here, but it is very recent and it's, it's not been given much scrutiny to date for that reason. Um, in, in relation to the provision of information or advice, uh, either in the, the interpretation which says that suicide itself is a criminal offence or in the interpretation which says that suicide itself is not a criminal offence, uh, Professor Chalmers is very clear that the uh, provision of advice or information about suicide is unlikely, under the current legislation, uh, is unlikely to result in criminal liability uh, or is uh, uh, not normally regarded as sufficient for liability. Um, these are complex and difficult questions which need to be addressed with sensitivity today 
in the current context in relation to a wide range of treatment and care options, they would remain complex uh, and sensitive uh, issues to raise uh, in, 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 the, in, the, um, in the most professional of context uh, in the, the scenario in which this legislation had been passed. Uh, all we would have done is ensure uh, that people are able to make this choice if they wish to make it and are uh, certainly not under any uh, expectation or coercion to make this choice if they do not wish to make it. If, if, if I may, just uh, my, my question really is, uh, given the nature of palliative care and the nature of suicide, is it correct that the doctor should bring this up as suicide, if, given the fact the nature of it is the fact that you are taking your own life and palliative care is based on the longer term, term natural deterioration until the end. Is it correct that a palliative care doctor should um, be bringing up the option of suicide though? I don't think any of us would, would want a, a blanket assumption that uh, in all circumstances that must be a discussion that a doctor would initiate. Uh, but nor do I think that we would want a, a blanket prohibition which says that a doctor may never discuss this. Mm -hmm. um, I Didn't think it's a discuss, matter for, I, mean, I think it's a matter of instigate the conversation. Well, again, I would come back to the, the suggestion uh, that, uh, that I made earlier that uh, if there is a particular concern about yeah. this, uh, and the, the idea that merely raising the subject, merely talking about the subject or instigating that discussion uh, could be seen as a form of coercion. Uh, the committee might want to consider uh, a, a further safeguard, a criminal safeguard against uh, influencing a person to make a request. Mm -hmm. um, but I certainly would, would disagree that uh, merely having a discussion about uh, the existence of this as an option uh, would, would always be inappropriate. It's for... Uh, it's for care professionals uh, to uh, develop the relationship that they have with the people they're caring for uh, and, to, uh, and to be able to uh, give information and answer questions uh, in an appropriate way, given the, the needs of their patient. Uh, that's, that's the situation today. Uh, it's complex and difficult today. It would continue to be complex and difficult, but I don't think more so than the other decisions, uh, life and death decisions, uh, that people have open to them uh, in their, their treatment and care. Okay. Mike McKenzie, for a supplementary on this. Yeah, thank you, Convener. Um, in, in terms of this kind of conversation at any stage, um, you know, either an early stage or, 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 or approaching end of life stage, um, in terms of this conversation with your you know, GP physician, um, do you feel that it's a perfectly rational decision to make in certain circumstances where um, emotional, psychological, physical uh, suffering is such that it would be a perfectly rational decision to make to uh, seek to uh, as y y end your life in, in, in this way, in, in, in the form of assisted suicide? I'm not sure I've met any perfectly rational people, have you? Um, no, well... Perhaps striving for perfection is too high a bar. <laughs> um, would you say, just in, the, in terms of the ordinary use of the language, that it would be, in certain circumstances, a perfectly rational and a, a, a rational and reasonable uh, decision to make? In, in my personal view, yes, I can. I can. Uh, I would certainly say that in in, uh, in certain circumstances, I could see this as an entirely understandable decision. Uh, and uh, a decision which I think our society ought to be able to respect uh, and, and to acknowledge people's right to make that decision on their own terms. Um, whether it's uh, you know, rational kind of Im implies that we, we only make decisions with one part of our brain, and I, I'm not sure that's how we reach decisions at, uh, you know, on, on minor or uh, life-critical choices. Um, we, we're whole human beings, and we, we make our decisions... Uh, not only internally, but in a, in a context of the relationships that we are a part of. That's uh, 
um, not as helpful as I was hoping it was oh, going to be. And, I'm sorry. And, and, and what I mean by that, though, is that um, then in, in terms of our hierarchy of considerations, should uh, rationality be higher up than, say, the emotional, uh, you know, or other dimensions in which we may uh, make those decisions? I suppose... To Dennis uh, Robertson, who's been waiting patiently <laughs> with these... I mean, want to quickly respond to I, I suppose very briefly, convener, I would, I would come back to the, the argument that I made earlier, that people approach uh, these questions in very different ways because we have fundamentally different worldviews, because we reach, make our decisions in different ways. Some people are more, or, or perceive themselves to be more rational than others. Others are, are very much more in, in touch with or, or feel themselves in tune with an emotional or spiritual uh, aspect of life. None of these are wrong. None of these are wrong. People are different. And, and this, fundamentally for me, is why our society uh, and the care, the context of the care that we provide for people in these difficult circumstances should respect and reflect that diversity and allow people to reach their decision on their own terms uh, and support them to do so, uh, bearing in mind the, the caveats mentioned about capacity and, and so on. Thank you. That's helpful. Thank you, Convener. Yeah. Um, Dennis Robertson. Dennis. Thank you, Convener. Um, I think the majority of the line of questioning, Convener, has probably been gone over in terms of the, the direction I wish to go in the first place. However, with your indulgence, maybe seek clarity on a couple of issues. Um, and, and good morning, Patrick. Uh, the, the <clears throat> in an answer you gave to Bob Doris <laughs> some time ago now, um, a, you, you said uh, known to the practitioner when who were looking at a particular line of questioning there. Did you mean that the condition uh, was known to the practitioner to enable the practitioner to make a decision, or was it the patient was known to the practitioner to enable the medical practitioner then to uh, move forward to, to that, that, that initial step? Yes, I think I was referring to section 92C yep. of the bill, uh, which is, uh, relates to the endorsement of the first request. This is uh, yep. after a person has made their preliminary declaration, after they have made their first request for assistance, uh, the endorsement by uh, medical practitioner statements uh, of that request. A statement, the medical pra practitioner statement endorsing the request, uh, the, the practitioner may, making it may do so only if, in the opinion of the practitioner, a number of criteria, the third of which is mm. the person's conclusion that the person's quality of life is unacceptable is not inconsistent with the facts then known to the practitioner. So this clearly to me uh, it suggests that the practitioner must be aware of the uh, facts of the person's medical condition uh, and make a, a, a judgment that the conclusion about the, the person has made about their own quality of life mm. is not inconsistent so with again, those facts. So again, is that, that, that the doctor-patient relationship? Are you, are, you, are you saying that the practitioner is aware of the conditions that uh, are impacting on the patient's life or the patient themselves as an individual? It seems to me that if a, if a doctor was unaware of the conditions uh, that a person is living in, the way that impacts on their life, they would not be capable uh, of uh, satisfying the, the test in 92C. Okay. And, and that brings me to the point then when you answered the question to uh, Rhoda Grant then, in terms of, and I think you suggested yourself, that if you've got a good relationship with your GP and, for instance, you wanted that GP to continue uh, a, a being your general practitioner, however, they didn't agree with uh, uh, your initial endorsement, you could then move to another practitioner. Um, those two things don't seem compatible to me. Uh, the point I was discussing with Rhoda Grant was about the preliminary declaration uh, and the, the hypothetical scenario in which somebody... Uh, might wish to have a preliminary declaration recorded in their medical files uh, bef long before they contemplate the, the realistic prospect that they might be in a position of, of asking for assistance to commit suicide. Mm. Um, I think it would be for an individual to decide. You know, if they, if they have a, a GP and a relationship with them that they're happy with in general, yeah. but they know that their GP <clears throat> is not someone that they would be able to turn to because of a, a matter of conscience to make mm -hmm. this request should they ever need it, 
uh, it would be down to the individual to decide whether uh, whether they, they they wanted to consider changing their GP. I would hope that um, I would hope that that kind of uh, change wasn't felt to be necessary, mm. given that uh, a person's relationship with their GP is about a wide range of other issues than. Mm. Uh, than this. Yeah. I think by the time somebody was to make a first or a second request for assistance, mm -hmm. um, because of the scenario that they're, they're going to be living in, because of the circumstances that we know in which in other jurisdictions people actually make these requests uh, and seek assistance to commit mm -hmm. suicide, they would already be in uh, intimate contact with a wide range of other medical professionals. They would not simply uh, be uh, you know, going to their GP for the odd prescription. We're, we're, we're talking about two very different stages in life, I think. I think that's a presumption. Um, it may be a fairly wide one, actually. Um, uh, but, <clears throat> again, I come back to this point. Then the person may not be known to the GP, but the condition or circumstances of a particular illness would, but not necessarily the person. And that person's um, perhaps a, even a, a mental or emotional state I'm sorry, I didn't quite follow no, the question. What I'm saying basically is that the, in a circumstance like that, uh, we, we, you just described, um, the, the, the individual, the patient, may well not be known to the, the GP they go to. Um, but the medical condition uh, and obviously the impact of that condition whether it be a long-term chronic illness or whatever, may well be known to the GP and he could maybe make a decision on the basis of that. But he, he wouldn't know the patient. So he wouldn't be able to make a decision. Has this patient come, and maybe using Mike's terms, to a rational decision as to, as to uh, uh, maybe wanting to end their life? I think um, it's, it's certainly true that few people have uh, as close and familiar a relationship with their GP as uh, as some fortunate people might once have had. Uh, I think some of the evidence that's been heard about um, the, the historic context uh, in which uh, a GP who was very familiar uh, with a, a patient or with their family, uh, and this might have been more common amongst uh, wealthier parts of society, uh, a GP in that scenario might well, in, in previous decades or previous generations, have made the decision to end a, a patient's life. And we know of mm. a significant number of historical uh, uh, examples of this happening, uh, with or without that patient's mm. consent. Uh, I think in, in many ways we, we do have to recognise that that kind of close relationship uh, to, to GPs is, is less common in society now. Um, we, we should be recognising that... Um, in, in trying to ensure that people are central to the decisions that are made about their own lives, uh, we have to recognise the reality of the, uh, the kind of medical care that's provided and the, uh, the kind of relationships that they have. I see no difficulty, though, uh, with seeking uh, to uh, have a discussion with a GP about placing a preliminary declaration <coughs> on one's medical records uh, without, uh, without having a, an intimate and familiar relationship with, with a professional relationship with that GP um, it's a it's purely a recording a, a, a position uh, the, the the much later uh, scenario in which somebody is actively seeking assistance to end their life uh, in the current circumstance they're living with uh, we, it, it seems to me very uh, very hard to imagine that that's not taken in the context uh, of care that's already being provided uh, mm -hmm. for detailed and complex medical conditions. Mm. Okay. Hey, I wonder if, can you, if I may continue. Um, <clears throat> we heard in our evidence um, that uh, there is a potential there for uh, an individual maybe wishing to end their life because they become a burden to those that care for them. Um, and I think... It's, it's not in a sense of being coerced to make that decision, but the individual, rather than um, the, the condition itself, that uh, long-term condition, say, perhaps, uh, they've been living with, and, um, but they're actually starting to see the impact of that on the people that care for them, and they are deciding to end their life or seek to end their life uh, through uh, this process of assisted suicide based on not 
them themselves having a deterioration in condition, but the impact on others. How do we, how do we sort of come to terms with that sort of situation that the person is making that decision because it's having a negative impact on others? I think I would, I would answer in two ways. First of all, to look at the experience of other jurisdictions which uh, show that um, amongst the, the list of, of factors, uh, the, the, the feeling of being a burden to others uh, is, is low down the list. It, it's not uh, one of the, the, the principal reasons that people cite. Um, and even but those who have... potentially be if the, if the framework, the legislative framework is there for this to happen. Yeah, it's, it's, it's certainly potential. And the, 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 the proportion of people who do cite it, cite it amongst uh, other factors. So it's, uh, it's arguable as to, as to whether this is ever the, the sole or the, or the driving motivation to seek uh, an assisted suicide. But I suppose that the, the, second, the second sense in which I would um, respond to this is really to, to look at the, um, the experience in which the sense in which this can, this can cut in, in two directions. If a person decides, um, for example, uh, that their ongoing treatment, uh, I mentioned dialysis e earlier, or, or perhaps a, a, a decision to uh, ask for a, a do not resuscitate notice to be placed uh, on their, uh, their, their medical records or on, at, the, at the foot of their bed. If such a decision was motivated by a feeling that a person was a burden, would we still respect it? These are, these are decisions uh, and, and factors which have to be borne in mind today uh, in a wide range of, uh, of life and death decisions. And I, I come back to this, this argument that the, the, the choice of politically, cho the choice of allowing and legislating for a form of legalised assisted suicide, the choice of an individual to ask for it, the choice of an in, uh, another individual to offer that assistance. These are complex, ethically complex and, and life and death decisions. But they're no more so than other decisions that we already make, other laws that we already pass, other choices that we uh, allow people to make and other treatments that, uh, that medical professionals in particular uh, give and, and provide uh, and other care that's provided. There are already life and death decisions. This is uh, one of them. It's no more so. And the questions around coercion or feeling of a burden, these are, these are relevant uh, today. I, I don't see why this is uh, more relevant in the case of someone who might request assistance to end their life uh, than for someone who might request the treatment which sustains their life be terminated. Okay. Finally, convener, if I may, in your opening statement, um, you mentioned about empowerment. You, the relationship has changed between patient and GPs, which is to be welcomed, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> but this empowerment of choice of how to live their lives, is that a deliberate statement in terms of you didn't mention how to choose to die? Um, you mentioned I about living lives twice, actually, in your opening statement, and you've mentioned it in some of the answers you have given to members. But is it a deliberate uh, sort of line that you've taken not to mention it in your opening statement in terms of empowering people how to choose to die? Well, I think throughout the uh, the discussion, uh, I would like to think that I've been very clear about what this bill is about. This is about the the... Uh, the choice that someone would have to seek assistance to end their life, to commit mm. suicide, and whether somebody provides that, that assistance. I think, it's, I think it's understandable to, uh, to take the view that death is a part of life and to, and to be, if not comfortable with that, then fully acknowledging it. Um, and one of the critics of the, the bill uh, who gave oral evidence uh, I think it was in the, the panel of ethicists, actually made the point that the name of the bill, the assisted suicide bill, uh, is, I think she described it as more honest uh, than uh, previous forms of, of, of the title of this legislation. Uh, and it, it is 
uh, on the on the name of the bill, on the face of the bill, on the on the front page of the bill, very clear what this is about. Um, and I, I hope I haven't given the impression that that's in some way being uh, uh, occluded. Thank you very much. Thank you, Camille. I have um, a, a number of requests for to ask other questions. I just check that I've got my list right. I've got Richard Lyle, Mike McKenzie, no, uh, Bob Doris, and I've got a quick supplementary, I think, from... No? Right, OK. So I've got Richard Lyle, Bob Doris, and Rhoda Grant. A uh, couple of questions. Thank you, Convener. A couple of questions, and, and maybe seek your opinion. Um, you, you spoke there about do not resuscitate. We've all been in that situation that happened to me with my father-in-law. I didn't know he'd asked for do not resuscitate. Would you suggest that do not resuscitate in a hospital as assisted suicide? Uh, no. I think there is a category distinction between somebody's uh, right to refuse a treatment or intervention uh, and somebody's right to uh, seek a, a deliberate act which ends their life. This is a, a, a distinction which the bill makes. Uh, uh, in particular, the, uh, the section on uh, prohibition of, of euthanasia, making it clear that the final act must be that of the person themselves. Um, this is... Um, I think it's important to understand that this is not the same as somebody declining or, uh, or, or refusing or seeking to end a treatment or intervention. Uh, However, I, I, I do take the view that the reasons for placing the decision in the hands of the individual are the same uh, in, in relation to uh, a positive act to end a, a, a life uh, or to take control of the timing or, or manner of the end uh, of a person's life, uh, to take that control into their own hands. The reasons for doing that uh, are in many ways the same as the reasons for uh, placing individuals at the the very heart of the decision-making about uh, treatment or interventions that they might wish to accept or wish to refuse. Uh, I've, I've said a, a, a few times, we all know when we are born. We don't know when we're going to die. But through our life, we make decisions and we make a will or we uh, talk to our, our loved ones and we say when, what we'd like to happen to us after we die. And most people do plan that. Some people actually go and pay their funeral just now um, prior to, to, you know, and no one knows when they're going to die. And many of us do miss our loved ones. You know, we could all turn around and say, I wish I could have told Granny about, you know, the baby was born or grandfather or whatever, you know, and, and we look back on, on the, the good times that we had in our family. So when people, what's your personal view when people come out with the, the scare stories that they've come out with, Shipman case, suggesting that anyone can secure assisted suicide, that many of them are going to coerce their loved ones to die because they want a, a hold of their assets. What's your personal opinion and your view in the last couple of weeks on the evidence that's been given to this committee in regards to this bill? I think um, you're quite right that none of us know for sure uh, when we're going to die or the, or the conditions of that. We all do know that we're going to, uh, and um, I think most of us find it difficult to uh, to talk about that and, and to and to really relate to it. And that's perhaps why some of these stories uh, are very powerful. Uh, I think Sally Foster Fulton from the Church of Scotland, uh, who was not a supporter of the the bill, but acknowledged that there's a wide range of views amongst the members of the the Church of Scotland. Um, made the case that there are very powerful stories on both sides uh, of this debate and that powerful stories don't necessarily make good legislation. Now, Sally, as I say, is, is not a, a supporter of this legislation, uh, but I think I agree with her about that general point. These, these powerful stories um, can make us think. Uh, they can help us to reflect on how we feel about a wide range of scenarios, but I don't think they should necessarily dictate to us what the legislation should say. Uh, I think we should think carefully about the consequences of legislation that we pass and whether it's consistent with the principles that we believe in. And the principle that I am asking the committee to consider uh, is that of uh, putting individuals at the, 
the very heart of the decision making about life and death choices that they face. And lastly, Karina, if you allow me, you know, Belgium, Netherlands, Oregon, basically 64.8% of people with cancer and some neurological disorders. Suicides in Scotland, actually, uh, if you read through 40 to 44, 98, 45 to 49, 94, 35 to 39, 92, 50 to 54, 92, 30 to 34, 72, the... the That's people, the age group. Yes, right aye, the yeah. age group. Um, so many more people have committed suicide, sadly. Um, you suggested earlier that... And you didn't want to put a ballpark figure on it, but I think eventually you did. Um, was that round about the numbers under 100 people could take advantage of this bill if it was passed? That's what's uh, anticipated in the accompanying documents to the bill, uh, and I think it's consistent with uh, a, a proportionate uh, comparison in terms of the population size and so on uh, with other jurisdictions, uh, albeit some of those jurisdictions have uh, different criteria for eligibility and so on. I, th I think that's a, a, a reasonable estimate to make. Um, I think also uh, it's important to distinguish between what we're talking about here, somebody's decision to seek assistance to commit suicide because of what they regard as an unacceptable quality of life uh, and uh, suicide more generally. And I, again, I would, uh, I would ask uh, that the committee considers whether any actual evidence exists in other jurisdictions of uh, this kind of provision being incompatible with a, a, a proper and an ambitious approach to reducing suicide more generally in the, in the population. These are very different phenomena. They happen for very different reasons and in very different contexts. Uh, and I don't see any evidence from other countries that suggests a, a, a proper approach to reducing and preventing suicide uh, in the general population is incompatible with a, a, a legal and well-regulated approach to allowing people to take control at the end of their life uh, or in conditions of uh, uh, unacceptable quality of life. Thank you, Kinsian. Bob Doris. Um, yeah, um, th thanks, Convener. I, I, I started off, I want to explore what the scope of the, the provisions might be for, for, for assisted suicide. And I want to move on just now in, in relation to uh, the civil and criminal liability that will be removed um, should, should this, this, this bill go, go through. Um, and that is, of course, as long as the process is laid out in legislation, is followed, anyone assisting in suicide will no longer have civil or criminal liability for, for assisting in that, as long as the process is, is followed, as I, as I understand. But there's also a savings clause, of course, within, within the bill, and terminology such as... Um, as long as a person is acting in good faith and not carelessly. Um, and it's been put to us, obviously, by, by other people giving evidence that the savings clause is, is drawn so wide that what the bill seeks to do is anyone who follows the provisions of the bill won't be prosecuted, and anyone who doesn't follow the provisions of the bill and is involved in assisted suicide will not be prosecuted either because of a savings clause and that there's not enough detail to know when a savings clause would, would, would kick in and be appropriate and when it wouldn't be. Uh, the good faith terminology seems to lace its way, way through it. So I, I would kind of like your views on whether or not the savings clause is drawn too widely, whether there's enough criteria, whether you can envisage a case where someone would be prosecuted in assisting in a suicide in Scotland if this bill passes, given the fact that there is a, there is a savings clause. I think if people accept the general principle uh, and want some form of legal, uh, legalised assisted suicide to exist, very few people would want to see people prosecuted for, for very minor uh, technical errors, perhaps in uh, you know, the, the, the timing of a piece of paperwork or a, a, you know, something very, very minor and technical. And, and we would all acknowledge that minor technical errors could be made. Uh, they're not necessarily errors that should give rise to, to prosecution uh, as though they were uh, intentional or, or seriously reckless abuses of the, the legislation. Um, I'm uh, not of the view that serious changes need to be made to this section. I think it, it satisfies the, the need uh, as it stands. And I, I think that some of the 
slightly hyperbolic uh, descriptions of, of this section. Uh, I, th I think one witness perhaps used the phrase anything goes. I, I think that's not helpful or, or accurate. But clearly, if the committee was minded to suggest uh, changes to, to this section, I would look at that with, with an open mind and, and explore what the intention was. Um, now, I, I'm just trying to scrutinise this, this bill the way with any other piece of, of legislation, um, irrespective of, of, of personal views. But um, can you give us a, a flesh out a greater idea of what, what a savings clause will, will involve? I mean, I, I think under the current law is unclear, as, as like Mike McKenzie made, made that point, quite often a common sense approach to whether prosecutions actually ever take place um, is taken under the current situation and no one seeking to uh, prosecute under the current status quo or should this bill be, be brought in vulnerable people in dire situations who, who may assist, assist in a suicide. That doesn't seem to be what's happening currently and it certainly wouldn't be what obviously you'd expect Mr Harvey to happen if, if this is passed. But I didn't use the expression anything goes, but obviously when you codify the system around assisted suicide, um, if you have a very clear set out process by which you can assist someone in suicide and then you have a, a catch-all expression around acting in good faith, it would be reasonable for us scrutinising this bill to say, well, can you illustrate examples of what would be acting in good faith or what wouldn't be acting in good faith? And that probably brings in ideas of burden and coercion and different things again. It's just to get some clarity around that. I'm not saying anything goes with the savings clause, but what I'm responsible to do is ask, well, what does go with a savings clause? I mean, if, if you're looking for, for a specific example, I might suggest that um, the 14-day time limit, the final 14-day time limit, uh, after which, if a drug had not been used, uh, it's supposed to be uh, removed. Now, if, if the facilitator, for whatever reason, had been unable to uh, get there until uh, 14 days plus a couple of hours, uh, but had made every effort to, uh, to ensure that that time limit was reached, I, I think most people would accept that that's not the kind of... Um, uh, the kind of minor breach of the of the legislation that ought to require prosecution. Um, I, th I think, on the other hand, if uh, similarly, if if the the fourteen day time limit is is to remain as it stands, and I don't know if the committee wants to discuss that in in itself, if it remains as it stands and the bill was passed in in that fashion, uh, and the the decision was made autonomously to leave the drug available to the patient well after the 14 days, deliberately in contravention of that, that time limit, that would be seen as a very serious matter. Is that helpful? It, it, it actually is helpful, but I, I, I think that, that, that that's you, if you like, given us your, 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 your thinking in relation to, to the savings clause. It's whether that's then reflected in clarity and guidelines and, and the legislation itself. Can, can I move... Briefly to, to, to another, another matter. I, I think if sorry, I just say, sorry, yes, of just say very briefly in response, I, I think the, the general argument would be that we very rarely, uh, possibly never, pass legislation which uh, is entirely mechanistic in its application. Mm -hmm. If you take the view that at present there is a lack of legal clarity and that this bill seeks to not provide complete legal clarity in all circumstances, but to define one set of circumstances in which people have clarity that a particular course of action uh, is legally permissible, uh, then even within that course of action, there will be judgments as to be made uh, as to the application of that law, as there are always judgments to be made about the application of any law that this or any other parliament passes. But the, the general argument is that we need to provide a path, uh, a, a course of action which is uh, legally sanctioned uh, and which gives people some degree of clarity that they have that route open to them. Yep. I understand the arguments around clarity. That's why I was asking for initially clarity around the scope of people who would in theory qualify for assisted suicide and clarity to us when a savings clause would kick in or wouldn't kick in. And I personally felt that clarity perhaps wasn't, wasn't there. I, I was going to ask a supplementary <laughs> earlier on, but my colleague Dennis Roberts has been waiting very, very patiently to ask a question, so I forego the, the opportunity to ask a supplementary when people are talking about the medicalisation potentially of a city suicide like Nanette Millen 
was mentioning matters like that. And you can probably guess the, the question I'm going to ask. I've been asking it consistently to witnesses over, over the last few weeks. If assisted suicide is potentially a treatment option, um, that may be the wrong terminology. I'm not, I'm not, not trying to, to, to pick that terminology deliberately. But if someone goes to their GP and they say to their GP, you know, I, I don't think I, I, can, I can cope with this, I live with this anymore, and the GP goes, the GP identifies that that person would in theory qualify for assisted suicide. Does that, I know there's the conscience clause, which we can't put in here, but in theory, should, it, should a GP say, well, actually, you do have another option other than palliative care and, and uh, chronic pain management you could do, and it could be assisted suicide. So whether that would be a GP or whether that would be uh, the, 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 the plethora of, of managed clinical networks that exist within the NHS, at what point would you anticipate? Um, should or should anyone at any point say, uh, within the process of someone struggling to live with a life-limiting um, condition, say to them, well, you know, you do have another option. Is, is that, um, I don't want to needlessly alarm people, because I would be alarmed if that did happen, but it's a reasonable question for me to ask, because um, if you don't know assisted suicide exists, how can you access it? Um, and if it does exist, and you qualify for it, shouldn't you be told about it? So whose job would it be to tell individuals about it? First of all, I think that if Parliament passes this legislation, uh, it will have very broad recognition and, and acknowledgement in, in society at large. I think it will be general knowledge. Um, secondly, um, I think if, if we were to, to pass the legislation and one of the consequences is a more open discussion, a more open culture of discussing uh, death or the end of life or the, the treatment options that people have before they're in that, that circumstance, then, again, uh, fewer people would be in the position of, of not knowing. Finally, though, if it comes to it that someone is, that this legislation has been passed, that Parliament has decided this is the right thing to do to give people this option, uh, and somebody simply doesn't know, I, I don't see any reason why they shouldn't be provided with that information. In just the same way, uh, as I don't see any reason why somebody who is on dialysis and who is finding their condition unacceptable, their, their quality of their life unacceptable, uh, I don't see any reason why they should not know, why they should not be informed that they have the option uh, of deciding not to continue with that treatment or any other uh, life-critical treatment. Do, do, you, do you not have any concerns that, depending on which relevant medical professional raises that as a potential option, may undermine a relationship of trust that that, that um, our constituents may have in that, that clinical professional who who want who may want them to be punting for them to uh, have as good a quality of life as possible, but then that medical professional may feel obliged to say, well, actually, there is this other option. Is, is there a danger around the undermining of trust with, with medical professionals and, and patients? I think if a medical professional raises any of these options, whether existing choices that people could make uh, or a choice that people could make under this bill were it passed, if people do that uh, in, a, in a bad way, if pe people can, can raise these issues well or badly, sensitively or insensitively, uh, then yes, the way that a, a, a medical professional or, or a care professional uh, discusses the options that somebody has, the way that they do it can undermine or can build their trust. I suppose the question is, what do, you, what do you want to trust your doctor to do? Do you want you to trust your doctor to make the decisions for you? Or do you want to trust the doctor that they will give you all of the information that allows you to make your own choices? Mm. Okay, thank you, Patrick. I've listened carefully to what you've said. Thank you. Okay. Just, thank you. just a, a, can I ask a committee for a quick supplementary? I can't ask myself. Um, but... You know, and give, you know, given your responses to, and to, to Bob Doris and the saving clause, can I give you another example um, that you may want to address? But what if someone made in good faith um, a decision or an action about where the line is between assisted suicide and euthanasia? How would how do we deal with that that issue? 
I think if somebody uh, decided for themselves that taking an action which is the final act that ends somebody's life, they would very clearly be breaking the law under this legislation. Um, I, I think it's, it's pretty clear that the, there will be a range of scenarios in which uh, detailed regulation, for example, of uh, licensed facilitators uh, is expected. There's provision in the, in the bill uh, that that would be a, a, a regulated activity, that there would be regulations that apply to them. Um, but I think the, the, in terms of the primary legislation, we should be uh, focused on the, this category distinction of taking a final action which ends another person's life, which will remain criminal, and uh, providing assistance for them to take the final action themselves uh, on their own terms and in their own time. But you described it in good faith, that that person felt in good faith and he committed an act of euthanasia. He, he applied without... No, there, there is no... Um, the, the, there is no uh, ambiguity, in my view, in, in the meaning of the, the legislation that uh, nothing in the bill will allow euthanasia, nothing in the bill will allow or will decriminalise in any way uh, the ending of another person's life by an act that they had not themselves taken. Uh, and this, the savings section 24.1 uh, says, if a person, when acting in good faith and in intended pursuance of this act, makes an incorrect statement or otherwise does anything inconsistent with the act. So it has to be something which is um, in pursuance of this act. And this act is about assisted suicide and very explicitly not about euthanasia. Is, is there a, an ethical distinction in your view about assisted suicide and euthanasia, given that you, you have suggested that the whole purpose and principle of this is to give... Give that ultimately that that individual the right to. Yeah, I, I think uh, not only my view, but I think every uh, probably every witness who was asked a question in this area ha has agreed that there is a, a very clear ethical distinction between euthanasia, the ending of someone else's life by your action, uh, and assisted suicide, the provision of assistance for someone to take and act themselves on their own terms and in their own time, which ends their life, uh, just as there is an ethical distinction between that and the withdrawal of, of treatment. Should these are, these are then be reflected in the bill, and should there not be a legal distinction in the bill that, that makes this clear, rather than, yet again, leaving it to well, another I, set of guidelines? Another... I, I think Section 18 is precisely that. Um, Nothing in this Act authorises anyone to do anything that itself causes another person's death. Uh, I, I think this, this uh, prohibition of, of euthanasia is but very you, clear. You've, you've just said earlier that if that person, you know, the, the sort of case scenario, if it, you know, that person can claim that I was asked to do... You know, should there not be definition there to make that clear? If a person was asked uh, by... Uh, the person who had requested assisted suicide, if the person who was providing that assistance was then asked to take the final act, uh, perhaps by uh, pressing an injection plunger uh, or, or some other final act that causes the death, they would have broken the law. That's very clear under Section 18. Nothing in this act authorises anyone to do anything that itself causes another person's death. You believe that's clear and it doesn't need defining in, in any other way? I, I think it that... It doesn't say that, it, you know, it, it, it's in general, but it doesn't define that such an action would be be illegal and face... Well, you would have to... Uh, I, I, think, I think even <laughs> Professor Chalmers would accept that, that taking an action which ends another person's life is already illegal. Murder does not need to be criminalised. It is already criminal. Rhoda? Can I ask about the licensed facilitator? Um, in the bill, it talks about someone needing to be licensed, being over the age of 16, providing reassurance and reporting the death. But it's not entirely clear what the role totally, um, totally is. Are they the people that have the drugs that would be used for the suicide? Do they have to be there at the point that the person commits suicide? 
are they the only people there at the point where the person commits suicide? It's not altogether clear in what, what is their role in facilitating. Um, the licensed facilitator, facilitator under Section 19 is uh, expected to use their best endeavours to be with the person uh, when the drug uh, or other substance or means dispensed uh, is used. Uh, I think it's understandable that um, that might not always be possible. Uh, you know, we're, we're talking about, uh, at present, a period of, of 14 days in which uh, you can't expect someone to be physically present and awake and alert for, for an entire 14-day period. So someone is, is to use best endeavours to be with the person when that happens. Uh, and they're also required, as soon as practicable after the expiry of the 14 days, uh, to remove uh, the drug or other substance uh, or means still in the person's possession. Uh, so those are two of the, the, the most significant um, areas of, of uh, clarity in, in response to your, your question. Um, I think the, the, the section 19b, which talks about comfort and reassurance, is understandably subjective. That will mean different things in different circumstances and mean different things to different people. It would mean something very different, for example, uh, in a scenario where someone is surrounded by their loved ones, also giving them comfort and reassurance and support at an emotional level, uh, than it would for someone who was on their own, who had no family or friends around them, uh, and for whom the licensed facilitator might be a principal source uh, of uh, emotional support and, and comfort. Um, and um, I hope that I hope that goes some way to answering the question. Uh, th there have been some witnesses who have argued for greater specificity in uh, the role of the licensed facilitator, or particularly in, uh, uh, I think we talked uh, quite some time ago about uh, a precise definition of what forms of assistance are allowable. And, and my instinct would still be against a, a prescriptive list of specific physical actions which are permissible or not permissible. Uh, because we are uh, talking about uh, scenarios which will be uh, different based on, on uh, a wide range of, of different circumstances and which may change over time as well. So having a facilitator present wouldn't stop family members being present or indeed family members facilitating in maybe preparing medication or whatever? Uh, it, well, it, just to pick up on the term, the facilitator is is one particular person who is licensed and uh, and regulated in, in that way. Um, the, the bill does not prevent somebody else from offering the assistance. For example, propping somebody up in bed would be perhaps one of the more common forms of, of physical assistance that somebody might need in order to, uh, to uh, in, ingest a, a drug that had been provided. Um, it doesn't prevent somebody else, a family member, for example, from providing that physical assistance. Okay. And with regard to the reporting, if the facilitator wasn't present when the suicide was taking place, they still have to report it. Would they have to report that they weren't physically present? Because it, it may not be... They could assume the person has taken the drugs but may not have done. Uh, I don't think there's a... Uh, uh, an actual requirement for them to report uh, that they were not present uh, and that might be a, a reasonable change that the committee might feel that they wanted to include as a uh, I, I mentioned in an opening statement I think there have been several comments regarding uh, recording of information and reporting of information and whether it should be held centrally uh, I think that would be a reasonable change to, to suggest that uh, that if a facilita facilitator had not been able to be present uh, at the time a, a drug was ingested, for example, uh, they might record that and, and perhaps the reasons why that had happened. Because they wouldn't be a witness to the drug being ingested? I couldn't quite hear you, sir. They wouldn't be a witness to the drug being ingested at all, if that was the case? No, that's, that's not a, a requirement of them under the Act, but it might be a reasonable uh, expectation that they would report the circumstances in, in, in that situation. Yes? Would that, would that then lead to uh, a police inquiry then, if it's not reported that the facilitator wasn't present because there's no proof, therefore, 
and how the person actually um, was assisted um, in terms of the, their last act. Under the bill as it stands, as it was introduced, uh, the, the following section uh, after the licence facilities are introduced uh, is about reporting to the police and requires uh, that a licensed facilitator uh, reports uh, the, the facts of a person's assisted suicide uh, to a constable as soon as practicable. There, uh, I think, has been broad agreement from uh, witnesses, uh, including the, the, the police, uh, that the report uh, should, in fact, go to the Crown Office. Uh, the, to the procurator fiscal uh, in the first instance. It would be for them to decide whether there were uh, circumstances which required a police investigation. Um, I think there's a, an understandable reluctance to uh, be in a situation in which uh, every family at this um, uh, distressing time uh, would be subject to an immediate police investigation uh, if they had clearly followed uh, a legally sanctioned uh, and well-defined uh, path toward uh, asking for this assistance and having it provided. But you can see where I'm coming from. If the facilitator, the licensed facilitator, isn't present, hasn't been present at the time of death, um, they, they then, uh, as maybe being suggested, uh, report that they hadn't been present. So what I'm then saying is, well, how do we then verify that the correct procedure was undertaken? Well, the facilitator at present is required uh, to um, to make a report, and let's assume that, that this would be changed to the procurator fiscal that, who would receive that report, uh, where they believe that the person for whom the facilitator has been acting has died or is a, as a result of taking or using any drug, substance or other means dispensed or otherwise supplied for the person's suicide, or that the person has attempted to commit suicide in that way but has not died. Um, that, that latter uh, scenario, I think, is unlikely given the uh, zero failure rate of uh, organisations such as Dignitas in this area. But So th this, this is a report which is required when the licensed facilitator knows or believes um, that the person has died in this way. Um, I, I think it's quite reasonable to... They wouldn't uh, know if they weren't there, so that, does that come down? They believe. That's a very, very great thing to say, isn't it? It's very... It's quite, you know, it's a lot of ambiguity. They, they believe that the process was carried out. If they're not there, they can't know. But are you suggesting that they could per perhaps submit a report saying they believe that it was carried out appropriately? Well, yes. I mean, the alternative would be that they that no report uh, to anyone is is required, and I, I don't think that uh, that anyone would would support that. I think the argument for Recording and uh, uh, and uh, reporting and recording uh, information about this this process is has been well made and to, to not require a report to be made at all if the facilitator hadn't been physically present when the drug was ingested I, I think would be uh, rather remiss. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks, Dennis. Yeah. Thank you, Patrick, and and your colleagues uh, and, and all the colleagues here this morning. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, we draw this session to a close. Uh, as previously agreed, we're going into a private session. Um, uh, I'll suspend at this point uh, and reconvene in private session. Thank you.